But clearly, what isn't acceptable is that a blood test disappears into a vacuum for 48 hours. That is unacceptable in any hospital. It is just simply not acceptable. The facts of the case were very slow in coming out, and I think there was a bit of media spin and storm to stir up a kind of controversial event in Irish society. I think what is safe to say is that if she had had a termination on the Monday or the Tuesday, that she would still be alive. We cannot ever prevent deaths, completely prevent deaths, from sepsis in pregnancy. You know, the risk was there. It was, you know, as I said, it was sitting like a time bomb. They didn't know when it would click and explode, okay? And they didn't pay enough attention to it. On October 21st, 2012, a 31-year-old Indian woman, 17 weeks pregnant with her first baby, presented at University Hospital Galway complaining of lower back pain. She was found to be miscarrying and was admitted for observation. Seven days later, she was dead. Her cause of death was documented as being from septicemia, or blood poisoning caused by a bacteria. Three weeks later, the front page headline of the Irish Times read, Woman denied termination dies in hospital linking this woman's death to Ireland's law on abortion and to Catholicism and igniting an already heated debate on abortion in Ireland. Outrage was felt around the world. The Indian Times ran the headline Ireland murders pregnant Indian dentist and the Indian government called for an official inquiry into her death. Her grieving husband told reporters that she was treated in a horrendous, barbaric and inhumane way and was just left there to die. Her name was Savita Halapanavar, and she became the first woman to die in pregnancy at University Hospital Galway in over 17 years. But how could this have happened in Ireland, a country whose maternal health care record consistently ranks one of the best in the world? If Ireland is seen as a safe place to give birth, why did things go so tragically wrong for this couple? Following two official inquiries, more facts and details began to emerge about what happened to Savita Halapanavar and what her case represented for Irish maternal health care. The standard of maternal health care uh, in Ireland is extremely high and historically has always been very high. And in fact, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that at a certain point in the past, Ireland was perhaps even the world leader uh, in, in obstetrical care. The entire OBGYN community in India is quite taken aback and surprised about this case in Ireland because we know of the fact uh, that they follow the standard protocols and their maternal mortalities are as low as 8 per 100,000 compared to India where it is 212 per 100,000, which means they must be doing a lot of things right. The death rate from pregnancy in Ireland is 8 deaths per 100,000 births which puts Ireland amongst the leaders globally in terms of maternal health care. Ireland has consistently ranked in the top five or six countries in terms of safety for pregnant women. So in a country with such low maternal deaths, what went wrong for Savita Halapanavar? To try and understand what happened, we need to examine the timeline of events over her seven days at University Hospital Galway. On Sunday 21st of October, after initially being assured everything was normal and sent home, Savita and her husband Praveen returned to University Hospital Galway upset, saying Savita had felt a dragging sensation or something coming down. She was seen by the midwife and the junior doctor who examined her. They found that she had a dilated or open cervix and bulging membranes. This means that the sac surrounding the fetus was in danger of rupturing. Savita's waters were likely to break. The doctor also listened for the presence of a fetal heartbeat using a sonic aid and found that to be present. The doctor then phoned the registrar on call, a more senior colleague with these findings, and asked him to come and review Savita. The registrar examined Savita and also found bulging membranes and that her cervix was dilated or open. He made the diagnosis of inevitable pregnancy loss and discussed this with Savita and Praveen. He explained that he was going to admit Savita for observation. Savita and Praveen were extremely upset with this news. Both doctors left the couple alone to grieve. 
During this encounter, a blood test was taken for a complete blood count. The result showed an elevated white cell count of 16.9. This was a crucial finding, as it was the first indication that an infection could be brewing somewhere in Savita's body. In what would turn out to be a key system failure, this result was not noted in her chart, and the team did not check it for a full 48 hours after it was processed. Had this result been recorded in the notes or conveyed to the consultant caring for Savita, it would have been followed up and the blood test repeated. If on the first ward round, after she was admitted, it was part of the presentation of the junior doctors to the senior consultant. This woman has a white cell count of 16.9. I have no doubt that that would have begun a chain of thoughts and probably subsequent actions that may have changed the course of her illness. Savita was brought to a single room on St. Monica's ward. She was offered pain relief, which she took. The midwife would later state during the coroner's inquest that whilst the patient was in pain, she did not have the appearance of a sick woman and the level of pain she was experiencing was usual for patients experiencing an inevitable miscarriage. The management option considered and discussed with Savita and her husband was expectant management, a watch and wait approach. You observe the patient and let nature take its course. This is the usual management of a second trimester miscarriage where the woman is not sick. The standard management in Ireland for an infant miscarriage is expectant. That means we await events. We let nature take its course. It's only when we have concerns of a progressive infection that we actually intervene and become active in our management. At approximately half past midnight in the morning of her first night of admission, the call bell in Savita's room was activated. When the midwives came running into her room, they found her standing in the bathroom. Savita had vomited and there was a pool of clear liquid on the floor. A spontaneous rupture of membranes had occurred and she was leaking amniotic fluid. The miscarriage process was underway. In dealing with every case which appears in mid-pregnancy with a miscarriage, it's not as if the moment she presents to us, her life is at a great risk. Because in that case, Every single situation like this, we will be meddling and over-medicalizing and intervening unnecessarily, which may at times be more damaging than quietly waiting. We have to wait for the nature to act upon, which in many cases it will, because within 24 to 48 hours, the entire case situation will show us where this is leading. When membranes are ruptured, it is usually expected that a woman will miscarry within 48 to 72 hours. The fetus would be spontaneously delivered with the placenta and the process would be over. This is how one expects the miscarriage to progress normally. What if there are signs and symptoms of infection associated with this prolonged rupture of membranes? Does this situation allow the infection to spread and for sepsis to set in? But in 48 hours time, you're sure that there has been a rupture of membranes. The white blood cell counts are slightly going high the patient is not looking too well, the TPR is going out of range, then it may well be worthwhile acting at the appropriate time than waiting indefinitely for the next set of 48 to 72 hours where very quickly the infection can escalate, the degree and depth of the sepsis may soon run out of hands. Was this what happened to Savita? Would the undiagnosed infection and her prolonged rupture of membranes without delivery contribute to her untimely death? During the nursing care round on the morning after her first night, a midwife recorded Savita's vital signs. Her blood pressure was a little low and her pulse a little fast. However, the staff did not consider this to be significant. Later that morning, Savita's consultant obstetrician, Dr. Catherine Astbury, came to see her on her rounds. It was her first time to see Savita since she had presented to the hospital. The consultant noted that Savita's membranes had ruptured during the night and her pain had settled, but she had not yet spontaneously delivered the fetus. The doctor recommended that Savita have an ultrasound scan to confirm the presence of the fetal heartbeat. 
She would later explain to the coroner that her reason for checking the fetal heartbeat was to ensure that Savita wasn't left on the ward with a dead fetus in her womb, which could give rise to infection. I wouldn't agree that monitoring the fetal heart or the absence of the fetal heart is putting the care of a baby ahead of the care of the mother. In the case of continuous monitoring of a fetal heartbeat in terms of a mother that's coming in suffering a miscarriage, there's always an element of if there's changes in that in what's being monitored, if there's changes in the fetal heart rate, if there's other general systemic changes in the mother, they're all part and parcel of the interpretation of how the, mon the management should be instituted. Savita's scan confirmed the presence of a fetal heartbeat and the results of the scan were discussed with the clinical team. Crucially, at this point, the team were still unaware of Savita's raised white cell count and the blood test had not been repeated to see if the result was trending towards progressive infection. During nursing handover, a midwife called the registrar on call to discuss antibiotic cover for Savita. The antibiotic use in the treatment of Savita at University Hospital Galway would become a major subject in the investigation into her death. Guidelines for the management of miscarriage state that where there is rupture of membranes, an antibiotic called erythromycin should be commenced as a prophylactic measure. This means that although the patient may not have an infection, oral antibiotics are started as a means of preventing a possible infection because with ruptured membranes, there is an opening for bacteria to enter. Savita received her first dose of the antibiotic on Monday night, 21 hours after her membranes had ruptured, a breach of hospital guidelines which states antibiotics should be commenced once a woman's waters have broken. What the staff of the hospital didn't know was that Savita was carrying an infection and that infection was caused by a bacteria highly resistant to the antibiotic being used a bacteria difficult to diagnose and even more difficult to treat. It was now 32 hours since Savita's membranes had ruptured, but she had not yet delivered the fetus. On her morning ward round, her consultant Dr Catherine Asbury reviewed her chart and noted that Savita was comfortable and not in pain. At this point, however, she was still unaware of Savita's abnormal white cell count as the results had not been included in Savita's medical chart and no follow-up blood test had been taken. Dr Asbury discussed Savita's case with her and explained the need to monitor the fetal heartbeat to ensure she was not carrying a dead baby. Savita was upset by this situation and inquired about the possibility of receiving medication to bring on the miscarriage. This interaction between Savita and the consultant doctor would become a major point of controversy. According to her husband Praveen, Savita requested a termination of the pregnancy because she did not want to wait any longer to miscarry the fetus. According to Praveen's testimony, Dr Asprey responded, Unfortunately, I cannot. This is a Catholic country and we are bound by the law. We can't terminate because the fetus is still alive. Praveen's version of events would be strongly denied by Dr. Asbury during the course of the inquest into Savita's death. At the hearings, she testified that she informed Savita that the legal position in Ireland did not permit her to terminate the pregnancy, as she did not see that there was a threat to her life. Because of the discrepancy between Praveen's and Dr. Asbury's versions of events, there was much controversy surrounding this conversation and what was described as the Catholic comment. Months later, a midwife came forward to testify that she had made reference to Catholicism and several things became clear. The midwife came to check the fetal heartbeat. When Savita heard the heartbeat, she became upset and said not to check it again. Savita asked the midwife if there was something she could do to stop the heartbeat, to which the midwife replied, we don't do that here, dear, it's a Catholic thing. At the hearings, the midwife apologised for the comment but explained that it was made to throw light on the culture in Ireland rather than to be hurtful or insensitive. She said that Savita had mentioned the Hindu faith in relation to terminating pregnancies and the midwife felt like she had to say something. The midwife emphasised that she thought the conversation more as a chat and confirmed that it had no bearing on Savita's medical care. The coroner reminded her that the comment had gone around the world and attracted huge attention, but went on to point out that Irish hospitals do not follow the dogma of any religious persuasion to which the midwife agreed. 
These conversations and testimonies would become the major international focus of the case of Savita Halapanavar. The law and the Catholic religion were both suggested as reasons why this woman lost her life in Ireland. I don't think the statement by the midwife that it's a Catholic thing was an influencing factor in the treatment of the woman. It wasn't a fair representation of the midwife either. And it, it was the one that had this cachet of reflecting something that actually wasn't part of her management or her treatment, but was part of, you know, the culture here in Ireland. In Ireland, it is permitted for a pregnancy to be terminated if it is seen that there is a risk to the woman's life. In the case of sepsis in the second trimester, where the focus of infection is in the womb, the fetus would be induced and delivered if the sepsis was causing risk to a mother's life. The refusal of a termination by Dr. Astbury, citing Ireland's law on abortion, received a lot of international attention and criticism. Suddenly, Ireland's maternal health care system and laws were called into question. The media had a role to play in channeling people's attentions after the Irish Times initial report that Savita was denied a termination because Ireland was a Catholic country. I think a lot of people came to believe that terminations can never happen here even when the life of the uh, mother is at risk. And clearly that's not the case, uh, that terminations do happen in Ireland to save the women's lives and Savita didn't have a termination because the doctors at the time didn't determine that her life was at risk. So that very simple misunderstanding, if you like, uh, has probably led to some distortion. Reporting can be very emotive and it can focus in on aspects of the care that may or may not have a relevance. So it's very, very difficult. I particularly had a difficulty as a midwife because in the European Parliament there was a letter being circulated by another MEP that suggested that because we didn't have abortion in Ireland, this was the reason why there was a maternal death. That was not the case. In some ways, the discussion that arose from uh, Savita's death ended up feeding into a debate that didn't really have very much to do with the circumstances of her death. And the legislation that we now see in relation to termination of pregnancy in Ireland has very, very little to do indeed with the particular case that arguably made it happen. At approximately 7 p.m., a student midwife came to take Savita's vital signs. They were abnormal. Her pulse was racing at 114 beats per minute. An elevated pulse rate is one of four classic signs of sepsis. Noticing this abnormal result, the student midwife rechecked the pulse manually and confirmed it was elevated to 114. When she asked Savita how she felt, Savita didn't verbally respond, just moved her head from side to side. The student left the room and notified her superior, the clinical midwife manager, of this abnormal reading. Later, the coroner would find a discrepancy between staff as to what happened next. The midwife would testify that she bleeped the doctor on call and made him aware of Savita's elevated pulse rate. She then handed over to the night staff and went off duty at 9pm. The doctor claims he was never made aware of the elevated pulse rate. According to his recollections, he received a phone call after 9pm and was told Savita's vital signs were within normal range. He later added that had he been made aware of an elevated pulse, he would have gone to see her sooner than he did that night. This conflict of evidence would be critical to the events that were to follow. At this point in Savita's care, she had ruptured membranes for almost 48 hours. She had an elevated white cell count that the medical team were still unaware of, and she had now developed what's known as a tachycardia, or a racing pulse. But what did all this mean for Savita? In 2011, the UK Centre for Maternal and Child Inquiries released a report on maternal sepsis. The centre found that sepsis in pregnancy was on the increase and was now the leading cause of maternal death in the UK. The report lists the classic signs and symptoms of sepsis as fever, an elevated respiratory rate, an abnormality in the white cell counts and an elevated pulse rate. The report states that a persistent pulse rate of above 100 beats per minute is an important sign which may indicate serious underlying disease and should be fully investigated. Savita's pulse was 114. At this point, Savita had two of these four cardinal signs of sepsis. It wouldn't be long before she developed all four. A patient with sepsis may not present to you in a dramatic way. It's very subtle, it's very silent, very insidious most often and 
unless you correlate that something is not okay with this patient. She is looking more ill than what she is expected to. Any of these baseline vital parameters are not falling in line with what you would have expected. Then a high degree of suspicion, a quick alert and action, a quick blood sample to correlate what you're dealing with, and then you have to catch it before it spreads to the rest of the body. With ruptured membranes at 48 hours, a high Y cell count, a pulse rate 114, one would be concerned about choriamnitis. And indeed, I would stress probably early sepsis. All of the international literature does point out how difficult it can be to diagnose sepsis and severe sepsis. That's widely acknowledged in the world literature. However, there are certain sort of um, fundamentals that might have been better uh, done, if you like. Chorioamnionitis occurs when the membranes that surround the fetus are infected, and this was later shown to be where the focus of Savita's sepsis was. In his submission to the coroner's inquest, Dr. Peter Boylan writes that in hindsight, the elevated pulse rate of 114 was indeed evidence of a developing chorioamnionitis. In University Hospital Galway, however, the medical team was yet to make this diagnosis. Savita's infection had not been diagnosed and her medical team had yet to learn that the bacteria causing her infection was not an ordinary bug. Because of this, her infection would fester and spread and ultimately infect her bloodstream. To treat sepsis, a doctor needs to administer the proper antibiotic at the right amount and to remove the source of infection if the patient does not respond. In pregnancy, sometimes this means delivering the fetus and the placenta in order to prevent the spread of infection. At the Irish Medical Organization's 2012 annual conference, Dr. Sam Coulter-Smith, master of the Rotunda Hospital, said that he terminated four pregnancies in the previous year because of sepsis and its risk to the life of the mother. In all cases, the pregnancies were at gestations where the fetus was not viable. The baby did not survive. If indeed a patient has appendicitis, you treat them with fluids, resuscitation, oxygen, antibiotics. You remove the appendix, you do an appendicectomy. If a patient has choriamnitis and is not improving with fluids, resuscitation and antibiotics, you have to remove the contents of the womb. And that unfortunately means loss of the baby. But you are saving the mother's life. Things were to get unexpectedly worse for Savita on Tuesday night. Following handover, the night staff noted she was in good form but expressed a feeling of weakness. A nurse recorded her vital signs and again her pulse was above 100 beats per minute. At approximately 10pm, the staff midwife asked the doctor on call to review Savita in view of her complaint of weakness. The doctor claims that he was not made aware of Savita's elevated pulse rate and as the ward was busy that night, he said he would review her later. At approximately 1am, the doctor arrived to the ward and inquired about Savita's condition. The staff midwife informed him that she was sleeping since early in the night. He went to her room and looked in. He did not wake her. Praveen woke during the night. The room was cold and he could hear Savita's teeth chattering. She was shivering and unsettled in her bed. Praveen checked the radiator and found that it was not working. He rang the call bell and the midwife came to the room. Praveen told her that Savita was shivering and asked for extra blankets. When the midwife returned with extra blankets, she observed that Savita was shivering. She took her temperature and it was raised at 37.7 degrees. Savita was developing a fever, another classic sign of sepsis. The rest of her vital signs, pulse and blood pressure, were not taken on that occasion. In fact, there would be a gap of over nine hours before a complete set of vital signs were taken. This was a serious breach of hospital guidelines, which stated that in the case of ruptured membranes, vital signs, which are blood pressure, temperature, pulse and respiratory rate, need to be recorded every four hours owing to the risk of infection. In the UK report on maternal sepsis, it is advised that sepsis should never be underestimated. It is often insidious, and staff need to be aware that women with serious illness, especially sepsis, may appear deceptively well before suddenly deteriorating with little or no warning. Sepsis is complex, incompletely understood, and often difficult to diagnose and manage. The report notes that even despite excellent care, some deaths will always be unavoidable. When there's a spontaneous rupture of membranes, 
the guidelines in Galway and the guidelines in Dublin and the guidelines in the UK, and I'm sure the guidelines pretty well everywhere, say that you monitor that woman's vital signs every four hours. The systems failures were um, primarily not uh, monitoring her vital signs um, as regularly as they perhaps should have been monitored. Um, and also there was misinterpretation, I think, of um, clinical signs uh, early in the morning when she became seriously ill. Um, she developed rigors at about 4 o'clock, I think it was, 4.15 in the morning. And they were misinterpreted as shivers because it was felt that the room was cold. Um, but they were, in retrospect, they were rigors. Sepsis in pregnancy, how soon it can kill a woman, it's often underestimated. And it's the complacency of the clinicians because there may not be very many striking changes, but the timelines are to be noted. You know, today she's okay, tomorrow she's slightly deteriorated and you're not paying attention to that and soon the case will slip out of your hands. Sepsis is insidious and difficult to recognize. You're dealing with a population that are healthy young adults. They have good hearts, good lungs, good renal system, and they compensate so well. And it's only when they fall off the cliff that you realize they are in serious danger. And that's why it's very much the, the silent assassin. You don't see it coming. At 5.15 a.m., the midwife returned and checked Savita's temperature. Savita appeared comfortable and expressed no further complaints. Again, Savita's heart rate or blood pressure were not recorded. At 6.30 a.m., a second midwife went to Savita's room while carrying out the nursing care round. Savita was awake but complained of feeling weak and was experiencing body aches. The midwife recorded her vital signs, which were all abnormal. She had spiked a fever of 39.6, her heart was racing at 160 beats per minute and her blood pressure had fallen to well below normal. Savita was very ill. The midwife immediately alerted her colleague to go call the doctor. The doctor was on the ward reviewing another unstable patient and immediately went to Savita's room and began to treat her. A range of blood tests were taken as the possibility of infection was now very obvious. An ECG of her heart was done and blood cultures were taken. It would be these blood cultures that would finally make the critical diagnosis for Savita, as they would identify the type of bacteria she was infected with. Unfortunately, however, due to the nature of this test, it would take up to 48 hours to isolate the type of bacteria contained in the blood sample. Savita was commenced on fluids and oxygen. On examination, the doctor also noticed a foul-smelling discharge, confirming his suspicions that her ruptured membranes were the probable source of infection. Putting all of the pieces together, the doctor made the diagnosis of a probable chorioamnionitis, inflammation of the fetal membranes due to infection. He documented this in Savita's chart. With the signs of chorioamnionitis, early sepsis, and the ruptured membranes, I felt it, was, it would be prudent to expedite delivery on that Tuesday night. I think you needed to remove the source of sepsis. It was a substantial risk to the mother's life. When uh, the event happened at a quarter past four, uh, that's a time when if he had been called, what he might have done would have been to check the vital signs more uh, seriously, if you like, found out that her temperature was high, her pulse was high, and figured out that, yes, she is getting sick now, then contacted more senior colleagues. Uh, however, when he did contact a more senior colleague, uh, she was doing a caesarean section, so she was occupied and couldn't come and visit and review the patient. This is the reality of life in Irish hospitals, where they're very busy, they're understaffed, and they're running around chasing their tails, trying to prioritise who's sicker and who's, you know, who needs my most urgent attention. Significantly, the nursing staff on the ward that night regarded her uh, as among the less sick patients. And as I understand it, one or two patients died on the, on the ward that night. So there was a lot of sick people there. Later that morning, the doctor caring for Savita during the night met with the registrar coming on duty. He made her aware of Savita's spike in temperature overnight. He later claimed that he also mentioned the foul-smelling discharge to her, although this doctor would say that she had no recollection of this. Another serious communication error was to follow and would impact on what happens next for Savita. On the morning ward rounds, the consultant obstetrician, Dr. Catherine Astbury, came to see Savita. 
She was informed of Savita's earlier temperature spike and that she was now on a different intravenous antibiotic. Dr. Asbury noted that Savita's temperature was now 37.9 degrees, her pulse was 144, and Savita was complaining of feeling cold. She realized Savita had an infection. She explained to Savita that her concern was that she may have a chorioamnionitis, but she wanted to outrule other sources of infection. She informed Savita at this time that if they did not identify another source of infection, they might have no option but to terminate the pregnancy, regardless of the fetal heart. However, during this time with Savita, the consultant did not read from the patient's chart herself, where it had been documented that Savita had a foul-smelling discharge, but instead relied on her registrar for information. In what is seen as yet another communication failure, it would transpire in the coroner's court that the registrar could not remember reading the note about the foul-smelling discharge, and that it was possible she did not mention this critical information to the consultant. Crucially, Dr. Asbury told the coroner that had she been made aware of this foul-smelling discharge, she would have taken steps to begin a medical termination earlier. She admits that this was a communication error and that she should have been made aware of it. Savita's condition would deteriorate very rapidly over the next few hours. Her blood pressure began to fall significantly and by 10.30 a.m. that morning, she had developed severe sepsis. During this period, no notes were made in her chart and none of the medical staff were appraised of her rapid decline. The midwife who was responsible for her care during this critical time submitted a medical certificate to the coroner stating that she could not attend to give evidence or provide the inquest with a statement. In the meantime, the consultant checked Savita's blood tests that had been carried out by the on-call doctor during the night. Her white cell count had plummeted, indicating severe infection. She called the microbiology department and spoke with a consultant microbiologist for antibiotic advice. She was advised to add two further antibiotics to Savita's prescription. We now know that the bacteria infecting Savita was sensitive to both of these antibiotics. By lunchtime, Savita's condition had deteriorated significantly. Her pulse was racing and her blood pressure dropping. The consultant received a phone call from the ward shortly after 1 p.m., stating Savita's condition had deteriorated in the preceding hour. She decided that she would have to induce delivery at this point. She spoke to the anaesthetist on call with a view to transferring Savita to the high dependency unit as she was so unwell. After reviewing Savita, the anaesthetics team agreed to transfer her. They also suggested the insertion of an arterial line for monitoring and for drug and fluid administration. Savita was transferred to theatre for the insertion of this arterial line. During the insertion, she spontaneously miscarried a female fetus, and shortly after she delivered the placenta. The consultant went to explain to Praveen what had happened. Savita was transferred to the high dependency unit. Her condition deteriorated during the night, and she was transferred to the intensive care unit. Savita's medical records show that she was suffering from septic shock and multi-organ failure as a result. A tube was placed into her lungs to help her breathe. Her condition did not improve throughout the day. She remained critically ill. By this time, Savita's blood cultures had returned. They finally revealed what nobody had expected or known all along. Savita was infected with an E. coli ESBL bacteria, a virulent form of bacteria rare in pregnancy that is highly resistant to many of the commonly used antibiotics. If an E. coli develops ESBL, then it's a much tougher creature. It's kind of got a big suit of armour on it that um, the other regular E. coli's don't have. And so that changes the picture completely. It means that the bug has the potential to be um, a lot more aggressive inside in your body if it's causing infection. But perhaps most importantly, it is well able to fight off both penicillins and a group of drugs called cephalosporins. And cephalosporins would have been regarded, you know, up to quite recently as being cutting edge, as being really, really modern antibiotics. And the fact that certain bugs have actually developed an ability to neutralize their effect is quite dramatic and also quite significant. Under normal circumstances, particularly in obstetric situations, you don't expect ESPL infections. 
Now, ESPNs are not that rare, unfortunately, in Ireland now, but in that situation, they would be very rare. You don't expect it. So when somebody has shown signs of infection, you normally begin with the standard antibiotics. And if they're not responding, you add in another higher class. And, and that's the problem. And it's only when the organism is isolated, you begin to say, oh my goodness, this is a, a very resistant coliform. It's an ESBL. Uh, and that, that will be two or three days down the road. And of course, that's absolutely crucial in, in those situations. And then you're at that stage, you're going into organ failure and you have a problem. And uh, I, I would say almost definitely, it seems to me as if that was probably the major issue. But clearly the most important thing for the clinician is to know that this is an organism which is uh, present in whatever sample they've taken, particularly if it's in a bloodstream sample, uh, and that it's resistant to antibiotics that they would normally use to treat that kind of infection. So the really important data that the lab has to give back to the clinician is what the antibiotic uh, sensitivities of the organism are to guide the treatment in that particular case. It's the leading up to the ESBL infection, you're going to have the problem in the days beforehand. When the initial infection starts, you use simple, normally protocol antibiotics that you use in different situations. You find it doesn't work, the white cell count is still going up, the patient isn't any better, the temperature isn't coming down, so you change the antibiotics. And usually even with the second change, you'll find the ESBL won't respond. It's only when you isolate the organism, do your sensitivity testing, you then know you have an ESBL, you then know you have to use these special antibiotics. And that's the problem. The medical team now know that Savita is infected with E. coli ESBL and is not responding to treatment as her infection has spread and affected her organs. As her condition deteriorated in ICU, friends of Savita and Praveen came to give their support. Praveen sat with his wife as she became more and more unwell. At 1.09 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, the 28th of October, 2012, Savita Halapanavar passed away. Her cause of death was documented as multi-organ failure from E. coli ESBL septicemia. about uh, the case of an Indian woman uh, who lost her life in Ireland. I was actually a little taken aback with the reaction of the entire country and the headlines that the case made because the crown reality in India is that we needlessly lose so many lives out of pregnancy and pregnancy-related complications. That was my first reaction. The second amazing reaction from the entire country was that they did not know the facts of the case, but everybody thought there was something that was not done in the appropriate manner. And I was one of the few who disagreed with that massive reaction in the entire country, because I said not only in this case, but in any case where we are called to give expert opinions, we need to actually know the entire sequence of what happened and then whether it was an inappropriate decision made in good faith to tackle the case in a manner that they did, or it was a negligence, only then it can be teased out. And we cannot just throw ideas out of our own hat in imaginary situation. I suppose, though, the shock was added to as um, the details emerge of the particular case. And um, we can all probably remember the headlines that went around the world at a very rapid rate, which focused on the fact that someone was allegedly denied an abortion and denied an abortion in a Catholic country. And I think that very much set the tone because one can never underestimate the power of the media. And in this case, the media took what it saw as a message emanating from Ireland. And it set, very much set the tone of this case and our reactions to it and perhaps even acted very strongly for quite a while as a prism through which everyone was looking at this case, which was that it was about the denial of abortion. When the news of Savita's death first broke in the Irish Times, the two issues highlighted were Catholicism and the law on abortion. 
As details began to emerge, it became apparent that other issues were crucial to understanding why Savita died and for preventing other maternal deaths from sepsis. Issues surrounding the early diagnosis and management of sepsis in pregnancy, resistant forms of bacteria that need stronger antibiotics, a need for better communication between healthcare providers, midwife staffing levels and more. As the facts and the details emerged, it isn't that that was proven to be wrong, but I do think other issues came to the fore. And finally, when we had the inquest into the case, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, it emerged that her death was every bit as much to do with a failure of basic clinical care as it was to do with any delay that there may have been in um, carrying out a termination of pregnancy. The best thing we can do is to make everybody aware of the risks and continuous education and so on, and that's what we do all the time. Savita's death will certainly highlight uh, the risk of sepsis, and that's one of the things, one of the benefits, if you like, that if we're looking for good things to come from her death. Savita's death was, in my view, probably more to do with the basics of clinical care and the basics of managing infection in pregnancy, rather than to do with any legislative background that may have existed at the time she died. The issue of E. coli ESBL is a central theme to the tragic case of Savita Halapanavar. Worryingly, reports show that the incidence of this resistant form of E. coli are on the increase. Healthcare workers need to be extra vigilant to identify and aggressively treat this dangerous bacteria. The ESBL um, E. coli infection that Savita developed um, is a very uncommon one and it is highly virulent and highly toxic and multi-drug resistant. So um, she would be a classic example of how a woman can get very sick very fast with a very virulent organism that is highly resistant to standard antibiotic treatment. So she's a classic example of how things can go very wrong very fast in these circumstances. Uh, but the drug, that she, or the, the bug that she was infected with played a significant role in how seriously ill she became so quickly. I think her chance of survival would be a lot better if it wasn't ESBL E. coli. I think because it was so aggressive, she, cast, she went through the sepsis cascade very quickly and people missed the actual cascade evolving in front of them. On October 9th, 2013, the Health Information and Quality Authority released a detailed report into the circumstances surrounding the death of Savita Halapanavar. In this report, the authority identified a number of missed opportunities, which it stated, had they been identified and acted upon, may have potentially changed the outcome of her care. They concluded that Savita did not receive the right care at the right time prior to being admitted to the critical care unit. The authority detailed a number of missed opportunities to intervene during the time Savita was at University Hospital Galway, which, as they said, if acted upon, could have changed the outcome for Savita. These missed opportunities summarise the deficiencies in her care. Failure to review the results of the blood test, which indicated that it was likely Savita had an infection. Failure to commence antibiotics as soon as her membranes ruptured. Failure to develop a more comprehensive care plan in light of ruptured membranes and the risk of infection. Failure to monitor her vital signs every four hours as per guidelines. Failure to recognise Savita's abnormal vital signs as a clinical deterioration likely caused by infection. Failure to change her management plan as soon as the diagnosis of chorioamnionitis had been made. Compounding this shocking litany of system failures was the presence of the toxic and resistant E. coli ESBL, a combination that would ultimately prove fatal for Savita Halapanavar. The death of any young woman for any cause when 17 weeks pregnant is a tragedy. Maternal mortality in this country is thankfully quite low and for someone to die in childbirth or someone to die in this case early in pregnancy, I think isn't something that you can expect either socially or even medically. It's not something that doctors expect to see and it's certainly not something that we 
and the broad public expect to see. It was a tragic case where a young girl lost her life. A husband lost his wife and child, and parents lost their daughter. It was also a tragedy for Irish obstetrics, and it was a tragedy for Galway. I'm sure the obstetrician and the midwifery staff were highly upset about this whole event. The woman died, uh, obviously. That's a tragedy, and nobody wished for that. By the same token, I think you have to respect the the people who are doing their best in very difficult circumstances. On the same breath, when it comes to Ireland, I think they're already doing their best. And one odd case like this, yes, in statistics, it's one odd case. But in reality, if we consider and pinpoint even in that odd case, if attention and luck both were on the side of the patients and the clinicians, this life too could have been saved. If you've been affected by any of the issues raised in tonight's programme, there are some contact details you may find useful on our website, tv3.ie forward slash helplines. Next tonight on 3, it's Cold Case.